officially begin the recording. Find that. Welcome everybody. It's so great to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today we're gonna to be talking about the battles between the branches. And what can cause those battles between the branches is separation of powers. You probably in your life heard a lot about separation of powers or checks and balances. We're gonna dive deep into that today, go through some clear definitions and then dive into the history as well as the current debates around it. Now to do this today, I'm not by myself, thank goodness. I'm with one of our top scholars, Tom Donnelly. Tom, would you like to introduce? Absolutely, Curry, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Tom Donnelly. I am one of the senior fellows for constitutional studies at the National Constitution Center. Thanks so much for being here this Wednesday. Can't wait to dig into Battle of the Branches. Yes. Yeah, so I'm really excited about this as well. Let me know if I glitch, because I think I'm glitching a little today, solar flares. Um, but today we're going to go through four main sections. We're going to start with definitions, because sometimes you just need a really clean, clear definition of what the heck separation of powers is and what are checks and balances. Then we're going to dive into the founding story and talk about where did these ideas come from? What was the debate around the founding era? What were some influences on the founding fathers? Because it's not like it was just a light bulb that came out of nowhere. They were influenced by other people before them and some of my favorite people that I love to talk about. And then we're going to dive into some testing of the separation of powers and watch the branches do a kind of tug of war, push and pull with each other, which is how the system is set up. And a great person to do that with is Andrew Jackson. So we'll dive into Andrew Jackson and then we will wrap up with a modern discussion of the battles of the branches and where you have probably seen in the last year the branches battle and how the courts have stepped in. So Tom, lots of big questions on this. How did we get here? What are they? But I really think we should start and begin with those definitions. So can you define some of these terms for us like separation of powers and like checks and balances? Absolutely. Yeah. So let, let, let's start with definitions, maybe some examples. And then I also want to connect it to some of the big principles that we've talked about in the class so far uh, during the semester. So let's start. So let's just start with the separation of powers itself. What is this? What is the separation of powers? What are the separation of powers? Well, it's just like the name suggests. It's that division of power between the three branches of the national government. And, and the idea is that, you know, we really don't want too much power, too much political power placed in one place, in one official, in one branch, in one agency of government. And so it's, it's, it's really driven by the, the, the desire above all to avoid the abuse of power, to avoid what the founders would have called tyranny. And so, you know, as we're looking at separation of powers, where do we see it in the constitution? Well, there's no single separation of powers clause. You can't, you can't just say, oh, there's a separation of powers clause. We know uh, uh, that that's in there. Um, but what we do see is, as we look at how the Constitution sets up the branches of government in Articles 1, 2, and 3, at the beginning of each of those articles, the Constitution grants certain powers to each branch of government. So with Article 1, it establishes a legislative branch, Congress. Oh, sure. sorry. No problem. <laughs> Keep so going. Article, yeah, no, so, so Article 1 is establishing uh, Congress. It's placing the legislative powers in Congress. Article two is establishing the executive branch, placing the executive power in the president. And Article three is setting up a federal judiciary and, and placing the federal judicial power, the national judicial power in that judiciary headed by the Supreme Court. So what does that mean in terms of their responsibilities? Well, Congress is gonna make the laws. Very simply, this is Congress is gonna make the laws. The executive branch, the president's going to enforce the laws, gonna carry out those laws. And the judicial branch, again, headed by a Supreme Court is going to interpret the laws. Now, how does this idea, so one, we said it's really about guarding against abuse of power, but how does it connect to some of the bigger ideas, the bigger principles that we've talked about in class? Well, what we have to remember is that in the United States, all power, all political power derives from the American people, from we the people. And so it goes back again to that famous language in the preamble. I'm so happy I found my paper uh, constitution uh, right before class, so I'm able to read from it. But the preamble, we the people of the United States, dot, 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 do ordain and establish the constitution for the United States of America. So we're the ones creating it. The power comes from us. And what that means is that in the United States, no single government official, no single branch of government, no single level of government speaks directly for us. Not the president, not Congress, not the Supreme Court, not your state government, not your local government. 
And so with this, we the people have the political power and that in the constitution, we are taking that power and giving it to the different branches of government, separating it out to the legislative branch, to the president and to the judiciary. So that's the separation of powers. What about checks and balances? Where does that come in? Well, separation of powers is again, divvying out core government power to different branches of government, giving those different branches of government power. And checks and balances is about making sure that we work in that system, work in that broader system, a way of making sure each branch can check the others. So if any, either, the, the theory being every branch is always, every government official, every branch, they're always gonna be grasping for power. They're always ambitious. They're always gonna wanna be doing more and more. And what we wanna do is be able to give each branch of government some tools when one branch goes too far, another branch saying, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that either because I have the power to tell you no or because what you're doing violates the constitution. And so what are some really concrete examples of this system that work within, the system, within our constitution? Well, one is think about the, how the, the process of making laws, of writing laws, of passing laws. So it's primary, it's Congress's responsibility to look at the constitution and say, I have this power. I'm going to now pass this law under this power. But what we have within the system is the president has a means of checking Congress. The president can take a law that was passed by the House and the Senate, it goes to the president's desk and the president can veto that, that law. Say, no, this law is not going to go into effect. And this then sets up an additional layer where con it go then goes back to Congress. And if Congress, two thirds of the house, two thirds of the Senate say, no president, we want this law to be in place. Congress can override the president's veto, but it's this battle. It's this battle between Congress saying, we have the power to make the law and the president saying, no, I have a veto power to keep you from making the law. And then similarly, <clears throat> we have some other examples there. One we just saw in action over the last couple months, which was following the, the, <clears throat> the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We see the president nominating a Supreme Court justice, uh, nominating a judge, Judge Amy Coney Barrett, to serve on the Supreme Court. So this is the president's power of appointment. What we see is <clears throat> it's not simply the president's power here. We also see there's a, there, within the Constitution, the Constitution grants the Senate the advice and consent power, which means that the president is going to nominate someone to the Supreme Court, the person that they want, and then the Senate has to decide yes or no, yes or no. And so it ends up being, again, a process of presidential nomination and the Senate having a yes or no. The two, uh, the two branches either working together or battling it out, depending on whether they think the same way of that particular nominee. So those are just two quick examples. Um, I saw, you know, the one thing I'd like to emphasize at the end of the definitions, What's the, what are the big ideas here? What are the big ideas? Well, one is the separation of powers, that through the Constitution, we the people divvy out political power to three branches of government, Congress to make the laws, the president to enforce and carry out the laws, the judiciary to interpret the laws. But furthermore, within that system is a system of checks and balances where each branch has the power to do just that, to check the other branches, to make sure that no single branch becomes all powerful. And I think this is like, as I like kind of like wrap that all together, and you said a couple big ideas in there, I wanna make sure we pull out cause it'll, it'll get us to how did we get here? So each branch has its own job. It's clearly its own job and this is what I'm in charge of. So Congress, that's the house and the Senate and together they make up the laws. The president is job is to enforce the laws. But when writing a law, that's Congress's main job, but they're not isolated and alone. They have to work together to get laws made, get laws passed and get laws in the books. And then the courts to interpret the laws. So they're all working together and working separately. And that's why I love this diagram here because it shows the connectivity that they're all connected, but it also shows it, what it could be, which is like a tug of war or it's a push and pull or yeah, or like a teeter-tottering that you're constantly moving around. And what you said there, Tom, is why I love the teeter-totter example, because the founding fathers were worried about it tipping to one side too much. And so these ideas that they came up with to give everybody different powers that slightly overlap um, was really to check. And because they were worried about one getting too powerful, one getting too strong. So can you talk a little bit about that and then bring us into the Founding Fathers? Where did they get their ideas from? Was this just like, you know, Madison's walking down the road and all of a sudden he's like, apple head, poof, separation of powers. Or did, when, were these ideas coming around in different people's minds and talking about government? 
Absolutely. And I, I think the teeter-totter probably is the, the best way to look at it, Curry, because really, if what we're thinking about, so we, we, we talked a little bit about the, the, the structure of government, but from the perspective of the framers constructing a new government, it really was about figuring out which powers to the legislative branch, which to the executive, which to the judiciary, and how do we make sure that they're sort of across this way and in roughly equal power and not one high and one low. So this is like, this is, they're trying to strike the right balance there. And so you're, so did, did, did Madison simply, um, you know, uh, think of this while laying, 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 laying in bed one evening or something? Well, no. I mean, the founding generation, the thing to remember about them is that they were voracious readers. They were very much children of the enlightened, enlightenment, Madison, you know, more so than maybe anyone else. And so what does Madison do before he decides to go to the convention? We've mentioned this in previous weeks, but he decides, you know, what I think would be a good idea. I am going to study all republics in the history of the world and, <laughs> and, and have a little notebook, my little notebook. And I'm going to say, OK, uh, Greek Republic, pros, cons, and look at how they structured their governments and try to learn from that experience. And we'll talk about it in one second. The other thing he wanted to do was before the US constitution, we had state constitutions throughout the country. And so we had experiences of both writing those governments um, and then living them out, running them. And so Madison and the framers were really trying to learn from both that the distant history of ancient republics, but also from their own experience in America, these state governments. Um, you know, if you're looking more- Oh, sorry, on a funny little odd note about Madison. So I always think like, what a bookworm, like that guy is like the definition of a bookworm. When you look at the definition of bookworm, you can find a saying like that in every single culture in every single um, country around the world. So I believe it's India that calls it a, um, a word worm. So somebody that just oh, eats the words. I know, I, I loved it. it. So like, it is a part of who we are as thinkers that it's not just Madison, it's all of us. And I love Audible, so I like to hear the words. So any way you can get that information in guys, go for it. And don't think it's not, you, I know you guys are on like the beginning level of this, you can do it. You can totally dive in. Cause we're gonna talk about my favorite guy to read and very short book, Lock in a Minute. That's right. Let's go right to them. So, I mean, among, so let's first, first, let's talk about a couple of the political thinkers, the framers draw, drew upon, and then let's talk about a couple of the experiences with the state governments that helped inform the constitution. So beginning with the political thinkers, who would be the two big ones when it comes to separation of powers? Well, I think for the, for the founding generation, you would probably say it's John Locke and Montesquieu. Those are the two big ones. And so, you know, if you're looking at them in succession, Locke comes first. Locke writes his two treatises of government. But both of the thinkers, what they're doing is they're looking at the experience that they, that, you know, in, in Locke's case, he lived through in Montesquieu that he's looking back to of the battle between the king and parliament, the legislature in England. And so in, much like we talked about with the framers in England, they're trying to say how much power to the king, how much power to the executive branch, how much power to parliament, to the legislative branch. And so it's those questions of how do we ensure a government that works, but also one of limited powers that can't abuse his powers. And so what Locke and Montesquieu come up with is this idea of the separation of powers. Locke takes a first pass at it. And really, if you look at his, him and boil it down, he gives us a lot to think about when it comes to the executive branch and the legislative branch. And so he's setting that foundation for how we think about the separation of powers. And then Montesquieu with his spirit of the laws comes, 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 uh, comes around you know, many decades later um, and what he does is he provides a, a fuller theory of the separation of powers. Um, his vision of the separation of powers is very strict. He's very concerned about the abuse of power by each branch and really thinks the powers of the branches have to be quite separate from one another. And finally, he also really begins to talk about this idea of there being a judicial branch. So it's with Montesquieu that we get something closer to our president, Congress, and judiciary. But it's the framers really reading Montesquieu, reading Locke, thinking about the, 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 um, the history that those thinkers cared about with English history, um, that they begin to think about the separation of powers. And you know, we, we, if we're projecting forward, so they learn from the political theory, but they're also learning from their own experience, their own experience of creating state governments. These state governments, of course, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the same, many of the same framers who are involved in the creation of these state governments. And they're still, they're looking back to Locke and Montesquieu as they're crafting these state governments. And so what do we see in these state constitutions? Well, we do see, we see some parts of the state bills of rights, the declaration of rights there that have explicit language, clear language, talking about the separation of powers. And you see language right here from the Vermont constitution like that. We really, and the, the, the language, we see it also in, the, in George Mason's famous Virginia Declaration of Rights. 
But what this language effectively says is we really mean separation of powers. Separate means separate, president, the executive, legislative, judicial. So that's one thing. They really do uh, buy into the, the strict separation of powers that we see in Montesquieu. The other is learning from the abuses of the king in English history, but the abuses of the king and his royal officials and governors in colonial America, these state constitutions write very weak executives and very strong state legislatures. And they think that's necessary to get the balance right because they think the danger there will be in the powerful executive. And so they're looking to rebalance, learning that the king was abusive. So what we want, we want the legislature, the legislature is closer to the people, the people are virtuous and that's how a republic's going to work. But you know, when we're projecting forward to the experience or from the experience of these state constitutions to on the eve of the constitutional convention, James Madison and his allies are looking back and saying, no, those state constitutions didn't really get the balance right. It gave too much power to the state legislatures. And as we're crafting a new constitution, we need to one, learn from political thinkers like Montesquieu and Locke, two, learn from these experiences under the state constitutions and really figure out a way to better balance the power between the legislative branch, the executive branch and the judicial branch. And then finally, they're of course also looking to the Articles of Confederation, which we've lived under as a national government, a national government that was very weak, but also one that didn't have a separate executive branch and judicial branch. And so the framers, as they come to the Constitutional Convention, are looking to address all of those issues. So I'll pause there, Curry. Um, I don't know if there, are, if there are questions or I, you know, I could obviously dig into some of the debates of the Constitutional Convention. I know, I think it's, it's really helpful because you know, we, we always learn about these moments in history and it may feel like isolated moments, but they're not. People have experienced, they're reading, they've lived experiences. And so they, it, I always think about it like a pendulum. They go, you know, they're so afraid of a king that they walk way too far over to a legislative branch that's in charge of everything and equal. And now they're trying to find that kind of happy medium in the middle with the constitution and with the convention. And so I think that's really tricky for, for our students to understand, but also to kind of add in all those pieces. And I feel like I'm really glitching, so I'm waiting a second. <laughs> so as, as we think about this, we think about how they're trying to find the right formula to balance it. But again, when writing it into the constitution, it's still in theory. It's saying, this is our best attempt, looking at these great writers like Locke, like Montesquieu, looking at our own experiences with the king, and with state constitutions, have we balanced the teeter-totter enough that it won't break? And I guess the first real test is right away. It comes out right after the Constitutional Convention, well, maybe not right away, but very quickly, we have some test of this system and how it works. And one thing I wanna ask you about this time, as you talk about these tests and dive into kind of the, the first big test, how much does the testing of the system help to define the branches? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a great question. Even just before we get to the test, it's, it's worth even just telegraphing, you know, what were, what were the two sides of the debates at the convention? So we have them, so we really have them on the table. Because on the one hand, the one thing I wanna, two things I'd like to emphasize. One is that there are certainly people at the convention um, who are really, really concerned about separation of powers, very concerned about any um, branch of government abusing power, really wanting to maintain separation and make sure everything isn't too out of control and powerful. But the flip side is we did have voices at the convention, like Benjamin Franklin, for instance, and nationalists like James Madison, who were interested in both separation of powers, but also creating a stronger government that worked. And so we end up with this, again, like it, this is not an easy task crafting this government to get that balance right, where you can maintain some separation, but also ensure that a government is more powerful than the Articles of Confederation and can govern well. And what we end up seeing, you know, both at the convention and then the ratification debates afterwards are, you know, on the one hand, the Federalists saying, you know, one, we, we, we need to strike this balance. And two, now that we have the constitution in hand and we're defending it and saying, you the, you, the American people should approve it, we strike the balance right. We do give new powers. We do create a separate executive branch and a judiciary. We do separate the powers out between the three branches, but we give those branches enough power to govern well. Um, but at the same time, we do have separation of powers. And so what this does is it allows a system where politics has slowed down. So it's not that separation of powers and checks and balances means we can do nothing, 
or that, we, that they're so excessive that we end up with a weak government like what we had with the Articles of Confederation, but it's that those checks will slow politics down. It'll force more deliberation. It'll force people, if they wanna do things, to compromise because you have to get past all of the different checks in the system. And the hope is that in the end, what this will do is throw out bad laws, cause people to come together around good laws and ultimately serve the common good. That's that federalist vision. That's what you see from the federalist at the convention, the nationalist at the convention. And it's what you see with Publius and uh, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay in the federalist papers in the ratification debates. The flip side being with the anti-federalists, you say, they say, yeah, 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 that's really nice. But what you've really done is create this huge government that's going, it's a new government. It's got too much power. You don't separate the powers of not enough. And those powers are gonna grow over time. And what you're gonna do is put all of the powers in elites in the capital city in Washington DC eventually, take all the power away from us, the people and us, the states. And so that's the that's, those, that's sort of the, the debates that we see at the convention, the ratification debates, but then we see as we get into these early battles of the branches. So sorry, Curry, that was a little no, long, but I, I wanted to at least get that on the table. I think it's great because I, what I love about that, so the anti-federalists and the federalists are having these debates in you know, 1787 to 1791, but sometimes those debates sound exactly like what I hear on the news or what I heard somebody say last week. So always that question of how do we balance between the branches and then how do we balance power in the federalist system? So this is why we bring it back to that all the time. But let's look at a test because we have about 10 minutes left and I want to look mm -hmm. at two tests. So I want to jump really quickly to Andrew Jackson and the bank war. So I know you might need to give a little bit of background to get here, but can you jump and kind of give us the framing of what was happening between the courts and um, the president at this time? So, and what year so, are we talking? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the year, uh, the bank war culminates here in 1832. Uh, but what we have to remember is going all the way back to the beginning of America under the new constitution, one of the great constitutional debates was, is it constitutional for Congress to create a national bank? And this fundamentally goes to Congress's power, the legislative branch's power, the new national government's power to define economic policy, to regulate the economy. It's one of the biggest questions of se separation of powers, federalism, you name it. It's one of the big constitutional questions. And we see at the beginning of, uh, of American history, first it ends up in the Washington administration, and so George Washington has to figure out, do I support uh, this proposal for a national bank from Alexander Hamilton? He asks his cabinet, is it constitutional? Alexander Hamilton, not surprisingly, says yes. But on the other side are powerful voices. James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Madison in Congress, Jefferson as Secretary of State, saying, no, this is unconstitutional. There is no banking clause in the Constitution. This exceeds the national government's power. So that's the first pass. And then a couple decades later, in one of the biggest cases, one of the biggest decisions by John Marshall and his Supreme Court, McCullough v. Maryland, the, the bottom line is that Marshall says the bank is constitutional. Congress has this power. Um, and so it's, it, it, we've debated it for decades, he even says, and it's settled. Congress has this power. But then let's, let's fast forward to Andrew Jackson. We'll get there as quickly as possible. 1832, here's Andrew Jackson. And what's happened is, Jackson's, Jackson has opposed the National Bank as a matter of policy, but he's also like Jefferson, like Madison at the founding, said that the bank is unconstitutional. Congress passes a bank bill, rechartering the second bank of the United States, saying you know it's, it's gonna go back into effect. They time it so it's right in the middle of Andrew Jackson's uh, reelection campaign. And they say, we dare you, Andrew, we dare you, veto this bill. Veto this bill. We, you know, Washington thought it was good. We thought it was fine. The Supreme Court under John Marshall said it was fine. Andrew Jackson, who are you to say that it isn't fine? And so Jackson, maybe not surprisingly, given everything that we know about Jackson, says, "No, I'm going to veto it. You guys, you guys are wrong. I'm right." And why is this a key separation of powers question? Because fundamentally, what this bank war, what this bank bill, what this decision by Andrew Jackson to veto the bank goes to is who has the power to interpret the constitution? Is it, it, is it the Supreme Court's power? Does the Supreme Court get a final say on what the constitution means? Or does, does the president and Congress also have a duty to interpret the constitution for themselves? And what Andrew Jackson says is one, I'm given the veto power. Congress gives me, uh, the constitution gives me this power to veto laws passed by Congress. Two, I take my own oath to uphold the constitution. We have that in article two, Section one, where he's, the president has to solemnly swear 
uh, that to the best of his ability, he'll preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So the president takes an oath to the Constitution. And with this, what Jackson says is, I have the veto power. I take this oath. It's my duty and responsibility to interpret the Constitution as best I can and to use my powers to defend that judgment. I don't care what John Marshall said. I don't care what the Supreme Court said. I don't care what George Washington said. I'm Andrew Jackson. I took this oath. I'm going to interpret the Constitution. I'm going to veto this bill passed by Congress. And so we have this amazing document. We're not going to have a chance to go through the details, but it's what's, it's what's called Jackson's veto message on this particular issue. He issues a veto message. And what this just is, is Jackson, much like a Supreme Court issuing its own opinion, say, explaining his reasons for vetoing the bank bill. And part of it is a function of policy and what you would say broader constitutional vision. So Jackson saying the bank's bad for the people. It, it really violates all of the commitments of equality we have within America. What it does is it enriches the, the, the rich and the powerful and doesn't do anything for ordinary people and that that's bad. But Jackson also importantly says the bank bill, the bank itself is unconstitutional for basically all of those reasons. Jefferson and Madison said the founding and I don't care what Supreme Court John Marshall said in McCulloch v. Maryland. I'll sort of pause there, Curry. I know, and this is, if you don't, there's many reasons not to like Jackson, but man, he is entertaining as a historical figure. Um, and, but it, this is so perfectly Jackson, but you see that battle, you see that battle between the courts and the president. And what Jackson clearly def says here is, I have a job to uphold and defend the constitution too. And it's my duty to do that. And he's saying that this is the reason why he's vetoing in this. This is the reason why he comes in, steps on the courts and, and says, we do not want to do this. So I love this story. And I also love this story because it reminds me that when we're doing this separation of powers, we always start with a constitution check and look at the constitution and say, what is the job of Congress, what is the job of the president? What is the job of the courts? And look inside article one, two, and three for where have they been given the duty to do this? I know Tom's word is going to be the vestings clause, right, Tom, I'm getting that right? <laughs> Oh yeah, the, 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 yes, that's right. So I always, I jokingly said a couple of weeks ago that like, it's like a vest that the courts put on or the Congress puts on, like that's the power vest that they have. It's the vestings clause. But why I love this case is fast forward 200 years to looking at this case. And so we're gonna look at a modern case around the Trump administration and ask this key question. So here's the big question of the case. How much power does Congress have to investigate the president's private finances? So his private money and his money history. So that's the question. But we start with the question is, does Congress have a duty to do this? Does the president have a duty or a right to not let them look into it? So looking into those Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, and thinking about Jackson saying his duty was to ensure that the constitution was followed. Let's dive into this, look at the powers and the struggles between the branches and break this one down for us, Tom, as we look at a modern case and separation of powers. Absolutely, and yeah, so this really comes down to uh, really, it, it ends up being a really great battle of the branches example because the, the fundamental question, the key question is how much power does Congress have to request, basically in this case, personal information about the president's finances from the president's accountants. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, and and what, what ends up being very interesting about this case is you see, as you often do in the Battle of the Branches, both sides, Congress and the president, making really, 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 really aggressive <laughs> assertions of power, really trying to say, in the case of President Trump, Congress, you are doing way, way too much and I have a lot of power. And Congress on the other hand saying, no, 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 Mr. President, we have the power to investigate and you are being abusive. And so the court has to get in the middle of these two branches, the branches going like this, Cong Congress saying we to the accounting firms, we need these records and the president stepping in and saying, no, 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 they have no constitutional power to get this. And the court having to step in and say, what? <laughs> The court ultimately having to really step in the middle and, and, and come up with a framework for resolving these sorts of problems. And so, you know, just to really place on the table, what's, what's at stakes? What, you know, what are the two sides asserting? Well, the president is making an aggressive argument about presidential power. 
Um, and, and Congress, on the other hand, is making a really aggressive assertion of a broad power to investigate the president. And so what the court, as, as there's Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote the majority opinion in the case, uh, uh, and the court majority has to sit there and say is, you know, both of the sides, as you often see in these battle of the branches, are making, uh, they're, 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 they're expressing themselves to have so much power that it risks violating other principles that we really care about. In this case, it's the separation of powers, but you, but, but, you know, um, in, in many of these cases, it's the, it, 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 if the court has to step in, the court's gonna have to step in to police really strong assertions of power by both sides. And so what happens in this case? Well, the Supreme Court ultimately says, one, this is a really weird case. This is what John Roberts says. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's a weird case because usually the way it's worked throughout American history, and Roberts tells this history, is it's not new for Congress to say it has a lot of power and the president to have a lot of power. But how this usually worked was that Congress and the president would yell about it, they'd get together, they'd negotiate, and come up with a solution without having to go to the courts. What's interesting about Trump v. Mazars is it's the Supreme Court having to step in when Congress and the president can't reach an agreement. And I think in the context of you know, increased partisanship, increased polarization, increased gridlock in Washington, the court, I, and we talked about this, we joked a little beforehand, Curry, about this, where it's, you know, you get the court, that's, the court is kind of like the parent here saying, we really don't want to step in and have to do these things. We never had to do it in the past. John Roberts talks about, gives an example from President Clinton, a Democrat, President Reagan, a Republican, where you know, they've been able to work this out with Congresses from the other party. And the, and the court's effectively saying, why can't you just figure it out? Pause. Then the court then says, well, if you're not going to figure it out, we have to come up with a framework for you to figure out these things in the, past, in, in the future. And so what the court has to do here is establish effectively a new legal framework for both the Supreme Court and the lower courts to decide these sorts of cases in the future. I mean, at, at the bottom line is what the Supreme Court says here is that the lower courts didn't enough, that, that didn't do a good enough job of accounting for the genuine separation of powers concerns in this case. So it didn't take seriously enough, especially the dangers of Congress having too much power to investigate. So what can Congress do? Um, you know, the Congress, if it has a really broad investigatory power, if they can really investigate, if it can demand a lot of records from the president, it can harass a president it doesn't like and make it really hard for the president to do their job. If you really think that you're in legal jeopardy, um, you know, that's something you're going to really focus on. You're going to have to put re your own, if the president is a single person in charge of a branch of government, you have to put your own, uh, you know, it's going, to, it's going to be on your mind. You're going to have to put resources into that. And so what the, what the Supreme Court with John Roberts here is really saying is lower courts, Supreme Court, we have to take seriously that concern. We have to make sure we come up with a legal framework that takes that concern in mind. But the flip side is, the Supreme Court also says, you know, Mr. President, you are not above the law. And so there are circumstances in which you are going to have to give up your records. When Congress has a legitimate legislative purpose, has a legitimate purpose to have this information, to do something that's within its constitutional powers, you have to give it up. The president is not a king. The president is not above the law. So that's sort of the flip side. And, what, and it, you know, there's a lot of legalese in the language here of, of the legal framework the court comes up with. But effectively, what the court says is, you know, lower courts, Supreme Court in the future, what you should do in these situations is one, you really have to ask Congress, why do you need these records? Really think about it. Congress has to give the reasons. Really think about it. Um, you, you know, you want to make sure that any request Congress has for specific records is no broader than it has to be. So you want a, a, a request that is really fits the purpose. If Congress can give a really, really strong and detailed reason about why it needs these records, Congress will do relatively better in the case. Um, and then finally, the, court has, the courts really have to take seriously the burdens that will be on the president in the future. And so again, it's, it's really about making sure this framework, which is drawing, I think, a lot on what we see in historical practice. So what the court is really looking at is, so what seem to be the baseline principles that Congress and the president have adhered to when they've been negotiating without courts? And now let's write that into the law. Let's make that the legal framework for everything going forward. But it's really hard. Which I think is fascinating because you're right. It's like anybody on a playground has had this moment where everybody's fighting and not working together and somebody walks in like the adult or like the most adult person in the thing and says, work it out you know, follow these guidelines, work it out. So that's what you see Roberts doing. For clarity, um, one of our students wants to know, why was Congress even looking in the first place? Like, what was the reasoning they gave behind 
So what was the purpose and why did Congress want the records in the first place? And has that happened before that they were able to look at somebody's records in this level? So that's a two part question. So, yeah, I mean, so they so the, the, just to give the two sides of the argument. I mean, what the, the, the president and his lawyer said was there's no real legitimate purpose here. They want to do this to politically damage the president. And that's not a legitimate legislative purpose. That's what the president said. Congress, on the other hand, said things like, you know, the, the president's personal financial records, financial records like this can be useful if what we're looking to do is figure out how people are gaming the tax system. So one of the core powers of Congress is the power to tax. And so it could shape what they see as abuses of the tax code over time. I think what you also saw in a lot of commentary around the case was on Congress's side that a lot of these sorts of investigations put, put President Trump you know, aside, but any president, if, if what's being alleged are certain you know, financial improprieties where there could be a conflict of interest that can affect the job of the president. This could also go to questions of impeachment and removal, which is also a power of the Congress. And so because of that, we need those sorts of records to do that, those sorts of investigations. Of course, the flip side being what the court said, which is that you have to really take seriously, this is a great burden on the president. The president is singular in our system. And so we have to get, we have to take those separation of powers concerns very seriously. You know, as to whether or not there's an example of the president's financial records like this, I have to say I'm not sure, but it's not because I just literally don't know one way or the other. Yeah, so they can do it if they have a really good rule, reasoning for it. They, ha they have to have a really good reason because the burden is so high on the president. That's in a nutshell. Yep. Got it. Awesome. Okay. So final and last questions of the class. This was a good, great one from Jeannie earlier. And she was talking about, we talked about there's a reason why we have separation of powers, that the framers of the constitution wanted to separate powers, but also overlap those powers. So different branches, not like this, had to work together to solve issues and work together and it would slow down the process and it would make them have to compromise more. That's in a nutshell, the idea. So Jeannie's question is this, if the framers of the constitution's goal was to slow down the politics around it and, and create deliberation, and that means like talking and compromising, does the rise of executive orders in the past presidents kind of defy the framers idea? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, from the perspective of that vision of the original system that's rooted really in deliberation and compromise, um, any mechanism that seems to be really, really quick action by a single branch, whether it's a presidential executive order, or frankly, you know, the rise of the Supreme Court and the power to declare laws unconstitutional in the early parts of the Republic, they didn't do that very often. They did it a lot more later. Anything that seems to put more power into a particular branch to act quickly that wasn't exactly the practice at the beginning is going to place attention on the system. But even then, you know, if anything, from the theory that the, the, the that the framers had that I articulated, you know, you could even if, if Congress was able to work together, that could even be a, an executive order in that context with a Congress that really wants to check the president or is interested in checking the president. It could just spur additional legislation and dialogue and conflict. Because, you know, if, if, if you have gridlock, the president acts and Congress does nothing. And then maybe the, maybe the Supreme Court steps in. That's sort of that. That's, that's when there's gridlock. But when there's actually activity and compromise, there's a possibility even with executive orders, it's still in the end governed by what Congress can pass. And so Congress still has a power above the president. It's a question of whether or not Congress exercises it. So really tricky. And it's a constantly moving and changing system with every test, every experiment. So that's what makes it so fun. This is why we say check the constitution where the power and where the duties come from. And then watch how the courts do have battles and see kind of where are they working together to move things forward and where are they in gridlock. And then remember Tom's opening line, which we always remember, the power comes from we the people. So if you see systems in Congress, in the presidency or in the courts that you don't like, speak up. <laughs> You're allowed to talk about what you want your representatives to work and how you want them to work together. So I wanna thank everybody so much. Tom, any final thoughts on this big idea of this week of separation of powers? Yeah, I think it's just what we said at the beginning, which is separation of powers is really just that division of the people's power to the different branches of government. Checks and balances are the powers given to each branch to check the abuses of the others. It's really, that's it. Awesome, great. Thank you guys so much. And hopefully we'll see you all on Friday in class when we have James Madison, not himself, 
but James Madison visiting us on our one o'clock class Eastern time on Friday and to tell us about what he was thinking when coming up with these ideas and how he read Locke and all these great ways that he put in separation of powers into the original constitution. So thank you so much and see you next time in class. Thanks everyone.